Oh what's, my God. What's going on? Uh, I can't, am I on? I, I'm such a big fan. I can't believe I'm on. <laughs> How you doing? Uh, you're not that big of a fan. <laughs> I am, Graham. I'm your biggest fan. You know that letter you got with the uh, with the 32 toenail clippings in it? That was from me. Oh, that's good. Was it weird at all? The Polaroid photos of various things in your body. That was not totally <laughs> cool. That was great. Yeah. Yeah, that was all that was on me. That was on me. <laughs> I I very much appreciate my audience, as I'm sure you do, but you can always tell every once in a while somebody just shows up and it's like, you're the most amazing. And they show up on all the platforms, all the live chats. And I'm always like, I always just start my stopwatch. What is it? Three months, six months before they lose their shit? What's it going to take? How long? When's the clock going to tick when they're just going to go bananas? And then the crazy single spaced all cap <laughs> emails show up and then yep. you're like, Oh boy, here we go. Yeah. Like, yeah. Or, or how long till they burn out, you know, if they're, right. I'm a huge fan and then you never hear from them again. They're just, they're just <laughs> gone. Like I can't yeah. do this anymore. I do what I didn't <laughs> ask you to do any of this stuff. Like you went nuts. You, <laughs> you know, they're like, like, I sent you three sweaters and I didn't get so much as a baseball cap back. And you're like, I don't, I don't know what kind of relationship you think we have. <laughs> I don't. Yeah. I just put food. I made you a casserole and I sent it in the mail and then you, <laughs> you didn't even eat it. It was in uh, a series of, of 14 envelopes. I couldn't fit it in the first envelope. <laughs> put a casserole in a series of envelopes and you didn't eat it. You didn't talk about it like that. That's nuts. You're just a horrible person. Like, you know, you sent me food through the mail, right? You're a complete stranger, <laughs> right? Like, you know, that's odd. Like, you're like, I, you're like, I ate it. Sure. But I didn't feel good afterwards. I'll be honest. <laughs> of course I ate it. I'm not a, I mean, I'm a single guy living alone. I'm going to eat it. You put food in front of me. I'm going to eat it, but I'm not, it's not going to be that big of a deal. Like, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I, I I ate it. You just don't get a thank you. I mean, Jesus. <laughs> it's weird that you said it, but I'm still going to eat it. I mean, I'm, still, <laughs> I'm not insane. Um, Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Government Secrets with Lee Cap, episode 34. <laughs> pew, 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 pew. Crazy fan intro. Pew, 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 pew. <laughs> um, Approximately 31 episodes than we thought it would go. <laughs> Pretty exciting. <laughs> Don't think we'll see 40. <laughs> How is your move? How is the Oh skateboard? man, it, uh, it 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 was good. It was not bad. As you can see, new new wall behind me. So just kind of a different setup or you know Yeah, yeah. It's, it's slightly bigger. The other places, the other apartment, the management company sucked and you know, it's those those type of things. God, it's like they don't let you set up a meth lab in your apartment anymore without a hassle. You know what I mean? It's not like, even like a not even like a miniature easy bake version. <laughs> easy, <laughs> easy bake meth. <laughs> I'd love to see some commercial with a bunch of kids. Easy bake <laughs> meth, din -in, din -in, din -in, like hazmat suits. Bunch of kids dressed like Breaking Bad. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> but but the instead of the like blue stuff that heisenberg made it's like unicorns and rainbows and <laughs> right. Bring, holding up a tray of, of rainbow colored meth <laughs> oh god oh easy bake oven meth with lee camp <laughs> um <laughs> well we've had an insane week as always um yeah we have yeah, we have. Yeah, we have. Um, so what do, what do we want to start with? We saw, I'm sure I'm not the first to make this joke, but it, it just occurred to me this this past week we saw uh Biden failing upwards, as <laughs> the oligarchy tends to do. They fall upwards. It was so okay, guy tripped on the stairs. There's that's not new, whatever. And that could happen to anybody at any age, but then he like started to speed up. <laughs> That's what was insane. I was like, why is he going faster? <laughs> yeah, you just just make the legs go faster. Then everything will work out after that. And it's like, and then he keeps falling again. I was then, wondering, because like 
their their big thing for him and all of his administration and everything is to make him not look old. You know, that's part of the reason that he's sprinting up those steps alone. Is like, no, no, we can't can't have AIDS with him. He's got to look. He's got to look like he can do it on his own. And I was wondering, like, how many steps would he have to fall down consecutively before they were like, okay, it's worse now to let him do it on his own. Send someone in to stop him from falling. Because he's already he's hit thirteen steps, and <laughs> and why why does any president, especially a guy this old, why are they like, yep, let's make him walk up that crazy long flight of stairs to get to an airplane? Like we can't put the guy in a jetway. There's not a lift that rises him. Like can't can there's something because just, they know because they know how old he would look if they put him on like a little elevator thing and he just stood there waving. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if I was president, I'm in good shape. I'd be like, do I have to run up? I already worked out today. Do I got to do more stairs? Like, what are the, what, I mean, I guess, I guess if I was president, I'd be like, you know what? I want a rope and I'm going to climb up there and get to the yeah. top. Yeah, USA. Totally give him just the rope with the knots in it. <laughs> oh my God. And you, you know, what's interesting though, he would do better than, than Trump on the rope with the knots because Trump. Oh, yeah. Trump weighs, you know, 260, 300 pounds, but right. thinks he's a spry young man. Uh, I mean, yeah. Made, uh, Trump could get up there if you made every knot like a Wendy's hamburger. <laughs> then, then he might be able to get to the top. But Biden. Um, or yeah. like, uh, like a, a, a brown baby for him to strangle. If like <laughs> each one he got up, he could kill another not white baby. I think then oh, he'd make it. So what's happening at the border, either one of them would do that. Uh, That's true. That, oh, yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, yeah, B Biden would probably want to imprison them more. But, yeah, yeah, he would just like, let's imprison these knots. <laughs> um, but put them in facilities, not cages. It sounds better when you have people in facilities. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. Does, do, do they have banners above as you walk in says work will set you free? Oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> I mean, seriously. Right. And but, but, but China is committing human rights violations. Oh, my God. I can't. Andrea Mitchell today. Jesus. She put something on. I got to read that. I'm sorry. This just makes me so irate because it's like. Th th uh, this is yeah, this she's the worst. She's the worst. Andrea Mitchell put um, the big difference between the United States and China at the end of the day is that China can't face criticism without jailing its critics or silencing <laughs> them. And in some cases, even killing them. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, Julian Assange, Andrea. Oh, that's right. You never mentioned him or you think he's a criminal or whatever. J Julian Assange, uh, Stephen Donziger, Mumia Abu Jamal. Yeah. Uh, Leonard Peltier, you want to just go down the list? Yeah, I mean, any of them. Gary Webb. Oh, wait, no, I'm sorry. He committed suicide when he shot himself in the head twice. I'm sorry. That, I, we shouldn't put him on the list. Um, the Listen, United once, States, once, once you get going shooting yourself in the head, you want to just see it through several yeah, shots, you know? <laughs> Absolutely. The United States built into our Constitution faces our challenges, overcomes them, and works towards becoming a more perfect union. Oh, my God. Okay, where do we begin on how ridiculous this is? First of all, this and 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 this is the corporate media. I'm I'm sorry. There, there. What what happened in in Atlanta is awful, and hate crimes towards Asians have been on the rise since the coronavirus. But our government, and not just Trump, the Democrats now too, keep talking tough on China. That actually helps fuel. This. It's not just yeah, yeah, but it's not just tough on China. It is all it is full on propaganda right. bullshit against China. I'm yeah. not saying Ch everything China does is perfect, but it's like there is not a fucking genocide going on. And you're diluting the term genocide by claiming there is. I mean, you look into the garbage they're quoting as a genocide. It's right. one dude. It's this one maniac, an evangelical anti-Semite German named Adrian Zenz, who makes up numbers and says it's a genocide and says God has told him that he needs to, that he's in a pursuit to, to stop communism in China or something like that. It, he's 
fucking crazy. And you have everybody from these clowns to our politicians to Democrats, Republicans, Democracy Now, all quoting him as if you should ever listen to the word the idiot says. Oh, and it's and first of all, and everyone goes, well, China's done this and this bad. I'm always like, I'm sorry. All of uh, did they kill 85,000 children in Yemen? No. Uh, are they bombing whatever we're at? How many? Five, six, seven countries? Who knows how many countries they're bombing right now? Kill I a mean, million in Iraq. Yeah, yeah. Did they kill a million in Iraq? Is there? Is did did they contaminate the water in Flint and a thousand other cities? Uh, did, they, did did Chinese pipelines break in America? Did they? Was it Chinese soldiers that were shooting uh, cold water at, at at water protectors at Dakota? Do they, they imprison? Do they imprison over two million of their own citizens per, like per capita? No, no. They no. We, we have more prisoners and and more prisoners per capita. And I'm sorry, they're trying to the media, of course, the corporate media, which spews all this anti-China propaganda. They're trying to say that what happened in Atlanta is just the 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 racism and white nationalism in our country, which we have plenty of. But I'm sorry, man, this constant. This constant spewing of bad China bad China bad that that translates to let's just get Asians. I'm sorry it does, and they can't they can't pretend that it doesn't. Right. And that's what that's what absolutely drives me insane. Is it's like no no you assholes are helping push this shit yep. by everything blaming everything on China. China's bad China's bad, and and Andrea Mitchell is pushing this, and it's like she's not helping. Like and I see these people like stop Asian hate, but by the way, China's awful. Like, what do you? What, come on, and we're going to get into it. I have a government secret we're going to get into, but the history of anti just Asian in general mm -hmm. attitudes in this country has yep. been going on for over a hundred years. Hollywood has been doing it since its inception. So yeah, we we have a long, rich history of anti Asian garbage in this country, and to act like that, you know, this Asian hatred popped up yesterday because Trump said some racist things, is a complete rewriting of history. It's insane. It's just like uh, I'm sorry. Did w was it Trump that did Japanese internment camps? No. Did he, oh, he yeah, did. Yeah, he he oh. was pretty young, but yeah, it was him. Oh, and he came up with the term gook during the Vietnam War and, and put that in all these Vietnam movies. Come on. The, the, really? I, I don't want to I don't want to I don't want to hear it, man. Like, it's just yep. like this and, and he also even though he didn't uh, it wasn't in the military. He's also the one that uh, that obliterated a third of North Korea's population in the Korean War. Yeah, I'm pretty sure he didn't drop the bombs at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Um but maybe we can pin it on him or blame China for that. I don't know. Um, it's just insane. Yeah, it's it's a, it's it's insane to see this hypocrisy and people don't don't make the connections. It's unreal. Um, yeah. But. Yeah. All right, buddy. What's the 224 people watching? Hit the like button, ladies and gentlemen. Share this on your social media. If you're listening on uh, uh, iTunes or Spotify positive reviews download all those all those clicky analytic things help yeah uh well since yours is uh mine's not related to the anti-asian hatred so if yours is let's go with that first all right government secret segment number one bow, bow, bow. um so i wanted to talk about going back to the history obviously the, the what to to, uh, to show many things one what happened in Atlanta is awful. Trump didn't help that his 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 rate his re rhetoric and his saying the China virus. But this has been going on for a long over well over a hundred years. And as we just pointed out, both political parties have spewed this China crap um, recently. So mm -hmm. even during the debates with Biden and Trump and all this other stuff. So um, I wanted to talk about. What happened um, in the building of the Transcontinental Railroad? Um, in the East, there was a lot of, uh, Irish and Mormons used to help build the Eastern part. And in the West, it was Chinese. Um, and they were completely mistreated, uh, by capitalists who were also, they took their capitalism and said, we're going to mistreat. We, we like mistreating workers, but if they're minorities, then we're, then we're going to really mistreat them. That's right. Our, it's, it's even easier because you yeah. can tell the, you can tell the white workers like, oh, well, you know. The, the Chinese workers are less than human, so they're right. they're below you. Um, 
So let's <laughs> bring this up. Um, Forgotten by society, how Chinese migrants built the transcontinental railroad. Um, so I want to go into this. Uh, they just celebrated the 150 year when this was a couple years ago. Um, from 1863 and 1869, roughly 15,000 to, to 20,000. I've, I've researched several. It's, it's in the neighborhood closer to 20,000. Chinese workers helped build the transcontinental railroad. They were paid less than American workers and lived in tents while white workers were given accommodation in train cars. So great system already. Uh, Chinese workers made up most of the workforce between roughly 700 miles of train tracks between Sacramento, California, and Utah during the 19th century. More than 2.5 million Chinese citizens left their country and were hired in 1864 after a labor shortage threatened the railroad's competition. And, you know, and, and maybe people kind of know this, but I imagine some aren't really thinking about it, that the, these railroads were going through just, you know, hundreds of miles of just nothing. Uh, so it's not like there was like towns every four feet or anything. So it was fucking brutal, man. I mean, imagine, imagine you're going through just like the wild west wilderness and you're trying to lay down a flat railroad with nothing there. Nothing. I mean, that's part of it. And this story goes into it. And I was doing some other research. I mean, like, so they, what you're talking about, they had to like dynamite through mountains. Yeah. They had to excavate stuff and thousands were like hundreds, if not thousands were just died. They just like got killed. Oh, the, oh, the thing collapsed or the dynamite blew up wrong or right. And yeah. they died and were just like, hmm, all right, we'll go get some more workers. You know, like there was, OSHA wasn't jumping in to make sure work conditions were, uh, we're all right. Yeah. <laughs> I, know. I know. And there weren't any real unions at the time, which is why when people are like, oh, we don't want unions. I'm like, unions are not perfect. They're only as good as their leadership. However, <laughs> <laughs> however, they are the only way that workers have any power at all. And without them, they can, the, the management can just blow you up or I don't know, make you work in an Amazon warehouse during a pandemic and not pay you anything extra, you know, just stuff like that. Right. Um, so the Chinese workers, as the article indicates, paid less, were put in worse conditions, and because they were the majority of the workforce, were also put in like the most dangerous thing. So it wasn't so like we got to go, you know, excavate that thing or blow that mountain up. It's like, well, the Chinese workers can go put the dynamite in there. Literally, it was like that. The white yeah. workers were going to let you sleep in boxcars, but these guys can go blow that up and potentially put them lives on the line. Um, yeah. All workers, they had to face dangerous work conditions, accidental explosions, snow and rock avalanches, which killed hundreds of workers, not to mention frigid weather. So it's frigid weather. So again, they're going through the mountains of California, Nevada, and Utah in the winter, and they get to sleep in tents. <laughs> nice. And I, I don't think they had like, uh, you know, North Face gear either. I think uh, <laughs> I don't know if there was an REI out there just yet. Maybe, <laughs> maybe they had set it up, and I can't remember if they were got those warmers that are electric or whatever. <laughs> but I don't know that they had solar charging out there that they could use. Yeah, yeah. Um, so all the workers on the railroad were listed as other, um, which is just shows you how the capitalists have always viewed labor. So it's like. <laughs> The Irish and the Mormons were other, so they weren't as valuable. But even below that, the Chinese were less than the uh, than the less than human other category. Their, their, their group was called sub other. Sub sub other. <laughs> <laughs> they were sub other. Okay, cool. Um, and so this this is mainly talking about. Um, so. Um, this is from an exhibition celebrating this, but um, the railroad company provided root and born for white workers, but Chinese workers had to find their own meals. <laughs> so what the fuck? like, yeah, you know, the seven 11. So again, all they got to do is go to an REI or as you said, a seven 11 <laughs> and they're fine. I don't know what all the complaining's going on. Um, 
So just I mean, sure they had to live off, you know, week old taquitos that roll around on the little roller pins, but still it's it's week old taquitos. <laughs> yes. And the taquitos of the late eighteen hundreds actually were pretty good. <laughs> Um, well, and, and, you know, the 7-Eleven out in the middle of the Rocky Mountains didn't have a lot of people coming through. So that taquito could sit there for, for weeks. It, for it, weeks. It, it, yeah. And sometimes the Slurpee machine wouldn't work. I mean, it was really, yeah, it was really challenging. And then good luck getting lottery tickets. <laughs> you know, like they're just not going to make it up to that the, hill. The, the lottery was, will I blow up today? Will I be blown up today? That's the lottery. Like this is. This is how sadistic these companies are. So we're going to hire workers that we instinctively out of the gate, we're going to treat like shit. But this group, we're going to treat even worse. So we're going to send you in to make yourself get blown up. You're going to deal with avalanches and snow and ice. And we don't even feed you. Like, yeah. gee, this, I don't know, sounds like slavery. Like to me, pretty, pretty damn close to slavery. And so then they had to go in to, um, they had to find their own meals, which are often brought to them from local merchants. So then they had to go buy their own food, man, what a deal. Um, <laughs> and they, uh, they're also, um, this is talking about the thing. Um, so their conditions were so horrible. And because the majority of the Chinese immigrants that came here were educated uh, and they were organized, 3,000 of them went on strike in 1867 to demand equal wages as the white workers were paid double. Um, so they already organized and knew how to do that. Mm -hmm. um, they were unsuccessful because they were out in the middle of nowhere. The railroad stopped them from getting food. That's how they made. That's how they ended the strike. That's they starved they them them out. Yeah. yeah. And you cannot tell me there wasn't racism with this because it's like these are the you know the robber barons who own the railroads were rich white guys who were like, okay, the Irish are less than, but the Chinese are even way less than because at least the Irish are white. They're at least white less than. Yeah. Um, and so they just, this was fueled by racism, just like the way they took the land from the indigenous people, from the Native Americans. They said, "Oh, you know, you're less than you. You're 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 you're, you're not white, so we're going to just take it and do what we want." Um, that's the other and, thing. And, and it's 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 you. It's easier to to treat workers like shit when they're in a new land they often don't speak the language they often don't speak the language of many of the other workers like you were saying irish and italian and stuff uh so they they will kind of take whatever they can get because they because they they don't even know like it's not like they have a community they can go back to there it's a lot easier to kind of enslave or abuse workers that are just, you know, they, because they can't get by uh, with the language and everything else, they are looking to the bosses for basically any way to survive. Yeah. And again, the language thing is not, is not a small issue because the Irish at least spoke English. So they eventually could assimilate into certain areas of government. Right. And mainly on the East Coast, there was a lot. The, the old stereotype was the Irish cops. Well, they got to be cops. They got to get into they got to get into government. They got to get into city councils. They, and they, they were able to kind of work their way up a little bit. Ten times harder for the Chinese who completely different language. I mean, even like Italian or German, those those languages are overlapping. But 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 Mandarin, Chinese and English are, are the two most opposite things you're going to find. Yeah. And so they took advantage of that. And gee, this might sound familiar when um, big American corporations have then for the last 20, 30 years been setting up factories in third world countries. It's sort of the reverse. They, they uh, exploit labor because this is a poor country. So if we set up a factory there, we don't have to pay union wages, 25, 30 bucks an hour. We can pay these people a dollar a day or two bucks a week or whatever. Yeah. And what else are you going to do? If you yeah. don't like it, we'll set the we'll set up the factory in another third world country. So then it was like when I hear the capitalists go, things are better. Capitalism has lifted millions of people out of poverty and blah, blah, blah. Not in the third world, you know, and this has been happening. 
I mean, probably since the dawn of time, really, if you want to go back to the pyramids, that was built by slaves. But this is this is how this there works. are. I, I, I will say there are some arguments as to whether the pyramids were built by slaves. It was it was clear. It was clearly aliens. No, but uh, uh, no, I, I it, it's I, I've seen several things recently that it's not like they were, you know, living high and mighty, but they weren't necessarily slaves building the pyramids. But anyway, <laughs> sure. Um, we, we can argue about that later. <laughs> Fine. Somebody that wasn't the royal, the aristocracy didn't build the pyramids. <laughs> we can agree on that. Yeah, sure. yeah. Right. The, the, the pharaohs weren't lifting, they didn't have 20 ton blocks on their backs. Yeah, I don't think the pharaohs were out in the hot sun working. Okay. Um, <laughs> so um, by paying laborers low wage, they were able to skim. This is the other thing that this is the, oh boy, the capitalists are so great. Um, there was, uh, the Union Pacific board members sitting on a business class train car from 1869 by paying laborers a low wage, they were able to skim millions from the construction and get rich. <laughs> so they, ah, uh. it's so great when not only do you make somebody's life worse, you profit from it. I mean, that's really the, yeah two for one bonus of the horrific um, consequences of capitalism. Well, yeah, it, it, it's such an immense level of greed because it's like, you know, they probably got a contract to build this railroad and it, the contract accounted for them to make money in, within the contract. But they realized, well, yeah, I could make some money, you know, still not a bad amount if I pay workers right. But man, the amount of money I could make if I pay them almost nothing is astronomical. So it's like, yes, the, the, you know, these, these people didn't just want to get rich. They wanted to get really rich. Yeah. And uh, again, the soullessness of, uh, you know, the ruling elites. And so what if some of them die? As long as I make a profit, like, who cares? Like, this is unbelievable. Um Building railroads is often profitable, but operating them isn't necessarily. If you look at the history of railroads in the United States, to totally condemn the businesses is, is challenging because they took huge... Oh, no, no I'm not going to listen to this guy fucking defend these capitalist fuckheads. But... Um, <laughs> yeah, classic guardian. Let's, yeah. let's tell you about how the Chinese were mistreated, but also about how the capitalist fuckheads were doing wonderful things. <laughs> yeah, just... Let's, to be fair... They they had to, they had to, they had they put up some risk. Okay, really, Guardian? Were they insert? Were they going through avalanches, Guardian? No, they didn't. <laughs> Did they tell me one stick? Of, show me a photo of one of them putting one stick of dynamite to blow up something to put down railroad track. Oh, you don't have that. <laughs> mm, interesting. Um, then let's talk about. Um, Chinese workers were not citizens, weren't allowed to become citizens. From the 1850s to 1882, they were tolerated in the U.S., but not accepted as peers. And then there was the Chinese Exclusion Act, which barred immigrants from coming on into U.S. unless you were a diplomat or business person. You're always welcome if you're affluent, then you're allowed to come in. Right. The Chinese Exclusion Act, which let's just click on this real quick. Um, from 1882 was approved. May 6, 1882 was the first significant law restricting immigrants into the United States specifically. I mean, it's called the Chinese exclusion act. Yeah. They weren't as clever with their titles back then. Yeah. Well, oh yeah. I mean, now they would call it the, the freedom, Chinese independence freedom <laughs> act or something <laughs> like right. stars and stripes, American Eagles for the Chinese act. And even yeah. though it's like you read it and it's like, Oh, it's saying, Chinese people are less than, but they, they get to put an American Eagle on a, on a flag or something. Right. right. Um, so that's the history. So the, literally the Chinese exclusion act. So that, and that's, and that's, and, and, and people would say, yeah, but that's the Chinese and this salon was the people in Atlanta was Korean, but that's, if you go into racism and American racism, they're just like, 
Well, well, yeah. I mean, if you go, it's not just, you know, you're talking about the early railroads, but it keeps going throughout our history and the, the internment camps during World War II. The fact that we were even willing to drop two atomic bombs, as you and I covered, that didn't need to be dropped, uh, mm -hmm. largely was thanks to the immense amount of racism towards Asians, Asians that meant that they were kind of like less than human. So why not test out the bombs on them? They're not really people. I mean, it, it really does go through the amount of bombing that went went on over North Korea. Like I said, it's like that level of just sheer fucking destruction largely wasn't done against like the Germans and, you know, with the exception of maybe Dresden. Uh, it, 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 it just, it, we, we treat, even in war, we treat, Asians different than than uh, when we're at war with someone white. I mean, I don't recall. Uh, uh, I think there might have been some kind of internment camps for Germans in America on a very small scale and limited. There, there, yeah, there was a small scale, but I, I did hear something about how how much better they were treated than the <laughs> Japanese internment camp. The where Italians weren't put into internment camps. We were at war with Mussolini. I mean. How come they weren't put into a turn? Why didn't we do? Why didn't we take their land? And and largely, um, you know, and we discussed this during the the atomic bombs of Japan episode that was I don't know maybe a month or so ago. But we talked about how a lot of the Japanese internment camps on the West Coast were designed for land grabs. It was like let's yeah. snatch up their oh we got to take their homes because they might they might be traitors and it was just to, it was just to take their land. And then when they were and then when they were released out of the camps after the war was over, they weren't given their houses and land back it was just like okay you're free now but you yeah. lost everything good luck and then yeah. you know too again with the specific with the chinese we we sort of reined in the racism towards them and asians and uh, towards the chinese specifically during world war ii when we kind of needed them as allies to a certain degree right and we painted them as 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 allies as we did russia russia was our ally in world war ii and then, as Malcolm X pointed out, the minute that World War II was over, suddenly Russia and China are our enemies again. And look, yep. it's going back to Andrea Mitchell's ridiculous quote, if China um, bought our weapons and gave us oil, then they could chop up an American journalist like the Saudis do. And the most they'd get is a stern talking to from Uncle Joe. I mean, it's it's... And the history of this, as we as we discussed, so it goes from the Chinese Excursion Act in 1882, and then again, and this happened even in World War II propaganda of showing the sort of racist, you know, uh, like buck tooth, less than human, and then they did that in Vietnam, and yep. they were they were, and if you watch even movies that I that I've you know are are even movies like. Apocalypse Now or Deer Hunter or, or Full Metal Jacket, with ha which have really strong anti-war messages in them. They still mostly depict the Vietnamese as just, they're not even, they're not, they're never full characters. They're just like the pajama terrorists or the, the women are only depicted as prostitutes or whatever. And they're never, we never meet them, talk to them. We never hear their point of view. We've never, and that's again, to talk about how Hollywood has pushed this narrative for since its inception um yeah th there's few movies that have ever been made that showed like that humanized them well yeah and i was i was trying to think and i was like well i guess good morning vietnam did kind of it, it definitely yeah. had you know uh asian Viet vietnamese characters and you it humanizes them and you get to know them but it also at the same time gives you basically a view on at least some american uh, soldiers as really good people trying to do good over there, but if we, you know, which I'm not, I'm not saying there aren't good, you know, my, my dad was in Vietnam. I'm not saying there aren't good people in Vietnam, but, uh, you know, that, that's not really the, the impression we should be left with as to what happened in Vietnam. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's like, um, I mean, and on and on, like, the other thing too, you want to watch a good documentary called The Fog of War, an interview with William McNamara talking about how America just kind of slowly kept expanding into Vietnam. And this goes to the same racism of just like that, that, that colonial, white colonial racism of 
Vietnamese, Chinese, whatever, you know, it's all over yeah. there and, yeah. and, and not realizing they're completely different cultures. William McNamara talked about, he met his Vietnamese, his North Vietnamese counterpart years later, like 20 years later. Yeah. And he, they started and he goes, he, and this is in William McNamara's words. He goes, it almost came to blows. He goes, cause I was like, I was like, you guys were going to line up with the Chinese. We didn't want that. That's why we had to put a foothold in Vietnam. And the guy's like, have you read a history book? We hated the Chinese. Vietnam, they, the Chinese treated us as less than. I mean, like, what are you talking about? And it's like that just racist, rooted in racism. Oh, they're going to link up with the Chinese. They didn't under, refuse to understand the culture. Just like, just like we do in the Middle East. All oh, those yeah. Muslims. Wait a yeah. minute. The Shiites, the Sunnis, the Kurds. Com three completely different things. Yeah. And this is part of the history of, of and the, again, why we, what, what we did in Vietnam, we shouldn't have been there. Ho Chi Minh came to this country in the late 40s and read the Bill of Rights and the Constitution and read our history and assumed we would be on his side because they were a French colony and they were like, oh, well, America's going to side with us because, right. and well, no, we're going to side with the French because you're Asian and we support big business and we're racist. And we support white people. And we support white people. <laughs> we support colonialism. As yeah, as white yeah. people can do whatever they want. And that's like the history of this. So like what happened in Atlanta, uh, this, this, these seeds, this was, these seeds were planted 150 years ago. I mean, right. yep. This wasn't and, and, and that's why it's so that's why it's so easy for Trump to turn to to activate that hatred. Because that mm -hmm. hatred was simmering underneath and has been built over over hundreds of years of propaganda about Asian people. Uh that's why all he had to do was give a couple of speeches and you have a certain percentage of America that's going, I knew it, fucking Chinese. They did it. Yeah. It's the China virus. It started in Wuhan. So yeah. they must have created it. And it's like, that's the other thing too. Like you say, this, this racism has been there for so long. So even during the debates, no one in the debates, the vice president or presidential debates, Bernie, Bernie was like, Hey, wait a minute. Let's, let's, let's try to maybe reason with China, you know, or, or, or they're not the big enemy. He got criticized wholeheartedly across the board. Because if you watch the presidential debates between Biden and Trump and Harris and Pence, the debate is not, hey, maybe we should reach out the, you know, extend the hand of peace to China and work together. It's just China's bad yeah. and how we're dealing with their badness is the only thing that's up for debate, which again, in my right. opinion, is rooted in this, this 150 years of racism. Right. Well, yeah. And, and, uh, going against anybody who's not within our, you know, capitalist, uh, right. the tentacles, the, the tentacles of our central banking system and everything. Yeah, no, there's no discussion. I mean, of the, the fact that in order to survive climate change, we're going to have to work. Nations are going to have to work together in order to survive environmental destruction that even unconnected to cap to climate change, we're going to have to work together. None of that's discussed. None of that's talked about. It's just, you know, Re, what, the different ways we're going to fuck China and fight against China. Same with Russia. Same with Iran. Um, but I do have a good. Uh, I have a good segue to uh, to what I'm covering here. Government secret second segment segue from Lee Cap. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the segue is early American. Uh, you know, basically workers versus capitalists versus the investor class. Um, and it also, I'm going to start off with, with, cause, cause kind of the, the, the center of the American myth, right. Is it's about rugged individualism that also goes with capitalism. You know, you, 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 you fight for yourself. You don't work with others and you achieve riches and wealth. And it's, you know, that, that's, that's what they try and tell us is kind of the heart of America and as if we've been that way since, you know, day one, it was all this rugged individual. People came over here and they fought on their own and, and, and achieved. And, and, you know, going back to our earliest days, uh, there, there, there was, there are just so many examples of communalism, cooperation, like that was the heart of it. 
uh, in those early days. And in fact, that kind of view of things had to be like destroyed and destructed uh, in order to allow for the kind of free market, you know, destroy your neighbor because he's taking your wealth kind of attitude. So um, if I understand correctly, you're saying in the early days of America, people were just pussies, right? Just helping each other out like a bunch of dumb hippies. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. It was early pussification of America. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, thank God we got rid of that. That's what we need. Fighting with each other, stealing. Yeah. Sticking it to your neighbor. Yeah, now we're talking America. Now we're talking. Atta boy. Uh, so this is coming from the book For All the People, uh, this uh, this the great historical analysis. It's all heavily sourced and everything. But so they start off with like Native American cooperation before the, the white settlers got here. And they say the hundreds of tribes and nations north of Mexico each had its own distinct culture, language, traditions and history. Yet almost every account stresses community over individualism as their overriding core value even among comparatively individualistic peoples. Culture patterns of economic cooperation were clearly ingrained in the fabric of every tribe. And so it's like the Native Americans needed to be crushed by our system and genocided, uh, not just because we were taking all the land and they refused to be good slaves. Uh, you know, they refused to be captured and, and made to work for us. But uh, also because I think their, their system showed uh, like that you could work in a cooperative unit uh, and it was incredibly, you know, sustainable and, and good and just. And so I think that's uh, yet another reason that, it, it worked with our system to, you know, get rid of the Native Americans. Um, but he goes on to talk about how groups of extended families were organized into larger cooperative units, clans and bands. The, co the collection of these family groups, uh, uh, sorry, the, the concept of individual private property in land or natural resources was unknown. Tools were commonly shared within the communal group. It was unthinkable, for example, for one Inuit in a band to have two harpoons while another had none. Um, wow, that's like, it's like, how are they going to have a good stock price if they do that? You know what I mean? <laughs> They're not going to have much of a value to their investors. Yeah, no, they, they would, uh, the stock's going to tank, really. The, the, whale, the whale blubber whale blubber stock is going to go down big time. What an insane concept to make sure that your fellow, your, your fellow human has, if they don't have something and you have more than it, that you help. What a crazy, what a nutbag concept. It's like, oh, man, like, um, yeah. it almost seems like everything that, like, the white settlers did was horrific and ruined the planet. Uh, in, in many ways. And in, 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 a, <laughs> in a, in a, in a, in a second, I'm going to, I'm going to get to, I'm going to also get to how, uh, uh, ma many of the early settlements were also communal, but then were basically slowly taken over by the more individualistic, greedy, rich kind of oligarchs. Uh, but the, the, you know, lear learning about the, the native Americans in the, you know, before settler times, it also goes against that whole idea of human nature is to like hoard wealth. Like a lot of people think that like, oh, well, you couldn't have that because it's human nature to grab everything you can and like get more for yourself. And and it's really not. That's a, that's a, a social engineering that that we learn in our society. Uh, and I'm not just talking about the, the immensely greedy, but it's like in our day to day, we're taught, you know, get, get a bunch of money so that you can be safe from the shit that goes down. Uh, it, it, you know, it's, it's like, cause, cause if you don't have that, who the fuck knows what's going to happen to you? You could end up homeless. You could end up without healthcare. Like, right. uh, so we're really trained. That's ingrained in us. And it kind of the opposite was ingrained in, you know, the, the, the native peoples then, um, then he also gets into how you know they had they had some level of democracy, uh, collective democracy uh, formed part of almost every native social system north of Mexico. The Iroquois Confederacy 
developed intertribal democracy on a large scale. Their council of uh, Sachems, I'm sure I'm pronouncing that wrong, consisted of male elders from various tribes appointing, appointed by female elders and made decisions by unanimous collective consensus. Uh, so then he gets into uh, the, the early colonial traditions. And this really blew my mind. I mean, I'd heard some of the communal stuff about native tribes, but I didn't really think about the fact that like the early settlers were largely communal as well, because it's almost, it was almost impossible to survive without that in the early days. Uh, close community survival cooperation permeated the entire way of life in colonial America. This was true of all the waves of settlers, British, French, and Spanish. Settlers raised houses and barns, plowed fields, and built fences cooperatively and collectively. Uh, and he goes into a long list of everything they did collectively. Uh, it served as social structures and gatherings that, that welded together the fabric of the working community of settlers in the same way that similar gatherings did among native peoples. Well, all right. I mean, you can live that way if you want, but you're never going to have a Lamborghini. <laughs> it's so true. Or you'd like have the Lamborghini and then someone else could like use it and you'd be like, fuck you. Yeah. Here's what I'm not hearing. I didn't No one was building a country club where only the wealthy could go. <laughs> Here, let me tell you what I'm not hearing. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I didn't hear anything. I didn't hear one thing in your little reading there about private jets. Not one, Lee. I don't get what you're telling me. Do you, do you, if, if it was communal, do you have any idea how many people would be in your hot tub? Gross. Okay. <laughs> it's weird. It's almost like you have to work together to survive. Huh. I wonder if that pertains to the environment and it's complete collapse that we're enduring right now. Anyway, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt. Go ahead. You're talking about the nonsense <laughs> a bunch of weirdos did a couple hundred years ago. Go ahead. Don't, uh, don't interrupt with your garbage about the environment. All right. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I hear your garbage. We're all in this together. <laughs> Shut up. I'm going to get my Lexus. Um, <laughs> Um, as one historian has commented, this power of the newly arrived pioneers to join together for common end without the intervention of governmental institutions was one of their marked characteristics. And, you know, especially in the out in the kind of, you know, what they call the wilderness or out in the Wild West and places like that, it's like there wasn't a lot of government structure. It was like people right. banded together uh, and and found ways largely to share and get through and share harvests and things without a government even saying that it, you, you, you have to give that to that person. It was like, it was assumed we got to work together or we're fucked. Um, and he talks about barter. There was a lot of barter, uh, but th this is interesting. The incessant waves of displaced humanity found warmth and shelter in, uh, on these troubled shores through cooperation, mutual aid, and sharing. Westward moving pioneers everywhere found group travel and group living normal. Cooperation, not competition, resounded as the dominant chord across the continent among the working population. And th this is kind of incredible because it kind of upends what we're told, what I, at least I was told in my history class as like the heart of the American venture was that, you know, from day one, it was about rugged individualism. And this is kind of the polar opposite. And this is why I think this fits in government secrets is, is you know, this isn't something the government's doing but or has done, but it's Th this history is is kind of covered up because it it completely teaches the opposite of what of what our system is is now based on. Yeah, and 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 it's it really like what it shows, and and it's really the theme of this podcast. I mean, literally for every episode, it comes down to this theme of the ruling elites that that have been in the since and that have controlled this country. And you could argue they've been ruling elites for a thousand years and they've always done kind of some, a lot of crap like this, but you should, it shows you how sophisticated the propaganda is in this country. And I know, you know, you, you have, you, you've traveled around the world and you have friends and fans and stuff that live in other parts. And when you talk to people from other countries, they go, man, you Americans are so propagandized and yeah. we're given two teams 
you you can believe this bag of propaganda, the liberal blue MSNBC propaganda, or the the conservative red Fox propaganda, or whatever. You know, like you're allowed to, and and then we'll introduce crazy things within to within those two spheres of QAnon or whatever. But it'll never point out the totalitarian structure of groupthink, which is that. That is deliberate that that was left. Now, I never read any of that. And again, I would argue I went to pretty decent public schools. My father was a college professor. My Both yeah. my parents were college educated, but that was never, we were always taught, you know, and you watch these shows, Little House on the Prairie or whatever, that you're just all alone out in the prairie making it yourself. And that's revered in our culture. You know, I you just go it alone and go to the top of the mountain and I live off the land. And it's like, it's impossible to do. And this history shows yeah. us that it was impossible to do. So they can just change the narrative, which again, it's so sophisticated, our social programming in this country for this American exceptionalism crap, which justifies, which allows people to be justified like, oh, it's okay, we're bombing Syria. Hey, we had to. The news said Iran backed. Like, that's not working together. We should be working with everybody. We should be working together to end war, to end homelessness. We could do all of these things. We could fix yeah. all of these things, but we're sold this nonsense and it starts here. It starts yeah. like, in the last segment. How are they able to, to so easily, both political parties and the media go, China's the bad guy. How are they so easily to do that? Because we just pointed out 150 years of institutional racism going back to the Chinese Excursion Act. Just like this working together is a bad idea. They've subliminally planted that in our brains through not telling us this. Because look yeah. what happens. Every time there's a disaster, what just happened in Texas, right? The community came together. The government was nowhere to be found. The community came together. Yeah. Like, People from all different texts had to come together. People have had to do that and just in this last year. And imagine how much even better it would have gone if coming together was more was more taught and more ingrained in us. You know, if we were grew up with, you know, more understanding of mutual aid groups and, and working together as a community, then it, there would have been even more, uh, you know, you're right. There were, there's some amazing examples of the mutual aid that went on in Texas uh, and went on in new Orleans after Katrina and things like that. But the, there's also, you know, the point that God, if we'd, if we had a, 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 a structure in place for these communities to help each other more regularly it would have gone even better. And, and also too, that, that thinking in, in these, in, in these like tribal or indigenous communities, if you had someone in your tribe that didn't have a bow or was living, it was poor and didn't have a place to live. You failed as a leader. If you were the leader of that tribe, you were viewed as a failure. Your tribe yeah. was a failure. Your community had failed. You have somebody that's poor that's not being fed. You, uh, you, you leader failed. I failed. The whole community failed. Not in America. Oh, they should have pulled themselves up by the bootstraps. Yeah. I, I, one of the quotes that I didn't, uh, I skipped over was they were talking about, uh, the, like group, the cooperative Buffalo hunts. And yes, the, 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 the warriors or the hunters that showed the most kind of prowess and skill and killed the Buffalo, they might get more of the, of the, of the meat, you know, of the, of the reward, but ultimately no one went without like Nobody. they weren't going to allow someone to sit there and starve while the, Oh, well he killed the Buffalo. It's all his. Sorry. You know, you would be, you would, the warriors would feel guilt. The warriors would have failed. I mean, the, yeah. they would have viewed themselves as failures. And it's like, I mean, so I've been an American Red Cross disaster volunteer for almost 20 years. And I've seen, and, and in Southern California, there's always big disasters. So, and I, and I was heavily involved in it from nine, right after 9 11. And, um, and I've, I've been to shelters and I've seen when, when, when a big disaster happens and people have been evacuated and there's a shelter, the community comes out. It's unbelievable. The community mm -hmm. shows up and you see other agencies and mutual aid and churches and different faiths and nobody, everyone's like, but then you always see a handful of opportunists yeah. like these contractor guys 
They're parasites. They listen on the scanners. So this one of the major things that Red Cross responds to is single family fires. And when you show up there, somebody's home has been burned to the ground. They've got nothing but the clothes on their back. And the Red Cross is called out by the fire department usually to like, hey, these people got nothing. They got nowhere to go. And the Red Cross shows up, gives them food, blah, 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 vouchers, you know, housing, opens up a case file, whatever, all this stuff as a place. And then you see these contractors, these guys in trucks show up like vultures and they go, oh, we represent your insurance company. Well, we'll they're just trying to get the contract to rebuild the fire, the house that got burnt down. Wow. And they go to people deliberately who are like, I've lost everything. I got, you know, and a lot of times it's like low income families who, you know, had a thousand dollars under their mattress. Literally that was their savings account. Right. That's gone. And these guys show up and say, oh, I say, oh, I represent your insurance company and they're parasites. And like, I saw it firsthand. I saw these people like helping out their neighbors, complete strangers helping out people just showing up with food, with whatever the whole community comes out. And then you see these guys like, Hey man, I got to make my money somehow. And it's like, yeah. Really? And, and, and on top of that, uh, you know, a great book to read about this is Scott Crow's, uh, I think it's called black, uh, uh, black flags and windmills, but he went down to new Orleans and helped create uh, one of the most successful mutual aid, uh, you know, facilities or, or, uh, you know, spots in new Orleans after Katrina. And they, not only is that story like not covered on mainstream media, you know, you can't talk about that citizens getting together and just helping each other without being a government agency. Uh, but a lot of the government agencies and the cops and the, the, even the military to some extent, although it sounds like the worst were the cops, were doing everything they could to try and shut it down, to stop it, to get in their way, to arrest some of them. Uh, and these are people that literally came from all over just to try and help people get food and water. Yes. Yes. Yeah. It's, 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 it's insane. Like the government's like, and they got to keep a stranglehold on it. And you're just like, I mean, uh, and, and this story, God, every I like doing this show, but man, it makes me mad. Sometimes. <laughs> I think you, I think almost almost every the point in almost every show where you where you go, you know, I like doing this show, but I don't fucking know. This fucking sucks. <laughs> it makes me so <laughs> mad because it's like we ha we had a system that was working. They everyone working together. It's real simple. We all work together. Well, hold on, I haven't, I haven't got to that yet. Oh. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, that, that's all right. That's, I want to make you angrier. We're not quite at boiling point yet. Oh, uh, <laughs> um, so uh, also to talk about like the communal land, like the idea of like everything could be bought up didn't exist for a lot of these early communities. Uh, communal land grants for this is he's talking about Spanish settlers in this part typically kept about 90% of their land in common, including pastures and forests for collective use. The common land could not be sold. Beyond that, each family owned a house and a farmable plot, but the common land was self-governing and all males uh, had a vote. Uh, much work was done cooperatively. But so that's the Spanish settlers. 90% of the land was, uh, was collective and couldn't be sold. Um, and then he gets into how uh, during the first three years in America, 1620 to 1623, the pilgrims of Plymouth farmed and worked communally, depositing all the products of their work into a common warehouse and taking their needs from a common store. The first New England colony began as a commune and later reorganized into a cooperative community. Uh, and then I also found this. So this is what I was talking about, about the segue of uh, workers versus the investor class. They weren't called capitalists back then, but, you know, that's basically what they were. Uh, but more than half. And I, I didn't know this. I knew all about we taught we learned all about the Mayflower. Right. In the in the in school. But more than half of the hundred and two people aboard the Mayflower were indentured servants, uh, you, you know, which meant they, they could work out of servitude over a number of years. But the day before landing, the servants staged an insurrection and declared they were seizing their freedom. The bulk of the pilgrims, which were free workers, sided with the servants. The masters had no choice but to agree to the demands. 
All adult males signed the Mayflower Compact, affirming that all were now free and establishing the government in which all males held equal voice and vote. Thus, revolutionary servants set up the most democratic political system of its time in colonial America, although it still excluded women. Uh, relations between the pilgrim settlers and the investors quickly deteriorated, though. The colonists struggled through many hardships, expecting, and this is, this is so interesting because this is, this is fucking Amazon workers today or something. I mean, it's, it's honestly, like from our earliest days, this, these fights were going on. So the colonists had signed this contract that basically they were going to come here and they were going to ship back things like lumber and fur uh, to enrich the investors who got them here. Uh, but it says the colonists struggled through hardships, expecting that the investors would send them regular supplies of food, clothes, and tools. Instead, all the following ships just came full only with new colonists, basically new workers. Uh, and the settlers were left to fend for themselves for survival while sending the returning ships back to England with furs, lumber, and salt fish to be sold by the investors. So the investors were fucking them from like day one. After, after, after three years in 1623, the conflict uh, reached the breaking point. The Pilgrim governor unilaterally broke the contract and assigned individual plots. These varied in size, depending on the size of each family. The families were given use of the land, but no inheritance rights. Two years later, relations with the corporation had deteriorated even further. At that point, a group of pilgrims terminated the agreement after buying out the investors and Plymouth achieved self-government. Uh, so it's kind of incredible that like, in our earliest days, it was the workers versus the investors. And he goes on to, you know, I don't want to read too much, but he goes on to say that slowly the, the, over the coming years, the oligarchy took over the a theocratic oligarchy took control of Plymouth. Um, and, you know, land was plentiful, but only at the price of, gen of the genocide of the native Americans, they, uh, started putting in property rights and that you could buy and sell land for long term and you could, you know, uh, it could be inherited by your children. So all of a sudden the property, the land is getting, especially the good land is getting bought up by wealthy investors. Literally, even in those, some of those earliest years, once, once they had land rights and you could buy them, investors started buying them just is speculating, hoping they could sell it later for higher prices. Um, so they were already like market, basically market forces were already destroying the communal system, the cooperative system, uh, even, even pretty early on. Um, and so you had a lot of, uh, farmers who couldn't afford land or whatever, they would get pushed farther and farther out into like the frontier in the wilderness, uh, small, small farmers commonly organized squatters associations to fight off the land speculators who were wreaking havoc in the rural communities. Uh, they would, the discontented would end up in a community kind of banded together out in the wilderness. Uh, that was kind of like a, a hive of, of bees, a new spot deeper in the, in the wilderness. Um, and anyway, he, he does, but then he goes on to list so many like wonderful examples in America's early history of like communalism, of mutual aid, of working together. And most of this stuff we're either not told about or we're not really told about it as if it's like a communal venture that's kind of the opposite of capitalism. Uh, he says, you know, the Underground Railroad itself was one of the best known examples of a mutual aid organization. Uh, obviously, it's just people helping others escape slavery without, they weren't looking to profit. It was just community. Benjamin Franklin, of course, created the first library, which was uh, communal, uh, you know, books. And, uh, and then he went on to uh, help create the, the uh, earliest cooperative firefighter company, right? Uh, these were all like some, and, and, and America takes like great pride in like our, the, uh, at least we were told in school and like live, you know, public libraries and, and our firefighters. And it's like a lot of these things we take this immense amount of pride in, in a country, are communal things, yes. but they're not described that way because then it would harm the propaganda. Yeah. I mean, it's like they're communal, which is really what socialism is. So when I was like, ah, oh, socialism is so evil. I'm always like, well, you know, the fire department is socialist and so is the police department and schools and roads and all that other stuff. And they're like, military. Oh, the military, yeah, the military is socialist. <laughs> it's like, and then you hear this description 
it's like, wow, this country really could have been amazing. But um, I mean, I keep waiting to hear like, and back in the 1600s, that's when they formed the CIA who started subjugating all of this. Like I'm amazed the CIA, it, they didn't get that started till the World War II. I'm amazed there wasn't like, maybe, I don't know, maybe it's the Freemasons. Maybe they're the CIA. Yeah, it, it was Illuminati probably. It was probably Illuminati. <laughs> but it's just like, and then people like, when you talk about communal and everybody working together, then invariably there's already somebody like, well, if you just want to run around and make everything like Burning Man, that's your business, you know? Like, <laughs> <laughs> like, like making sure everyone housed equals Burning Man. That's yeah, just <laughs> just just naked body painting on yeah. mushrooms. Um, <laughs> yeah, making sure everybody's housed, and it's uh, we could do it right now. We could do it today in this country. Yeah. Um, but we don't want to. No, we don't. Uh, there are, by the way, I, di I did a segment on Redacted and Ice recently. There are, especially during this pandemic, uh, many groups across the country that are taking back homes for the homeless, uh, basically houses that are technically owned by the bank or something, but there's no one in them. They're vacated homes. And, uh, you know, one of the, one of the big ones is in Philadelphia. They're, they're, Take, they've taken back, reclaimed something like 30 houses and they, they fight it in the courts uh, when, the, when the bank tries to take them back. Uh, the the uh, Poor People's Army, I believe, is what uh, they're called, with Sherry Honkala is doing a lot of it. And uh, I mean, they're setting a pretty impressive example. Obviously, in Philadelphia, it's just 30 homes, but what it represents is pretty amazing. What it represents is people saying the, the fact that there's anybody in this incredibly rich country without a roof over their head is fucking ridiculous. And if this place is going to sit here empty, then people should be able to use it. People should be able to live in it. Uh, it shouldn't be that we just have individuals buying up uh, an endless number of houses, endless number of property. You know, I think we've talked about before Bill Gates and Ted Turner own like the size of a Delaware in this country. Uh, it, 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 it's just ridiculous that the rich can buy all this up and obviously not use it because it's impossible for one human being to use all of this shit that they buy. Uh, so it absolutely homeless people should be able to take vacated spaces. And so how are they, that sounds great that they're doing that. And I hope they're doing this in more cities, obviously. How, so how are legally they're able to actually get the home away from the bank? Well, they don't do it legally because our laws are bullshit. They they just break, they, you know, they they go in or break in or whatever and and begin living there. And then when the bank or the police or whatever come and and try and kick them out, they go to the courts. And uh, they they've had some some good wins recently, but you know, it, it's an ongoing it's an ongoing fight. Uh, and you know, obviously, if you, you look at our quote unquote laws, then what they're doing is breaking the law. But guess what? Those laws were written by very powerful, rich people who <laughs> wanted to be able to buy everything. So uh, just because something is against the law does not mean that it's necessarily right or just or moral. So I challenge people to philosophically prove that a law should be that way. Don't just go, it's against the law. Like, let's talk about why that is. Why is it that someone should be sitting on the street in the middle of winter when there's a, a vacated house that literally no one's living in? Like, yeah, it's it's in many cities now, it's against the law to feed the homeless. That is immoral. I don't care what the law says. It's immoral. No. Like, no. the Chinese Excursion Act was the law. It was immoral. Like, <laughs> no. we could just, you know, own slaves. That was the law. That was completely immoral. Right. Like, you know- right. Everything Hitler did was legal. <laughs> exactly. So, yeah, this is bullshit about like, oh, it's illegal. I mean, Georgia just, what, two weeks ago passed a bill saying you can't feed or give people water while they're standing in line to vote. Yeah, well, fuck you. Uh, why don't we all go break the law and fucking yeah. bring pizza to people waiting in line to vote? And we'll yeah. be, we'll be, you know, fucking, uh, uh, <laughs> you know, criminals. Yeah. Yeah, we'll be criminals. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to go feed people waiting to vote. You can arrest me if you want, but I'm, uh, I'm, a, I'm a fucking outlaw because I showed up with a power bar. Yep, absolutely. And let's let's put let's do that and get that going to the Supreme Court. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, good episode, that, man. Good episode. great episode. Lee Cap, government secrets, episode 34. Lock it down and put it in the book. Boop, boop, boop. <laughs>
Put it in the communal books that we can all use whenever we want. <laughs> this is a communal episode of Government Secrets. <laughs> um, well, Lee Camp, this was fantastic. 591 people watching. Hit the like button. Subscribe to both of our channels. And and, and it's and it'll be many thousand by the time it's done. Uh, yes. Done with its run. So. Yes, it will. Um, where can people watch and listen to all of your uh, godless communal nonsense <laughs> that you like to pour down people's throats? Oh, my criminal outlaw material <laughs> is at LeeCamp.com. Uh, it's pretty much all free. Again, very godless to make it all free. Uh, the My other podcast is called Common Censored. Uh, I have a podcast that's all of my material from Redacted Tonight and other stuff as well. And that's called Moment of Clarity. So if you haven't checked out Moment of Clarity, check out that podcast. And it's all at LeeCamp.com. I'm on Rockfin and YouTube as well. So. Check that out. Right on, folks. Well, you can, uh, you know, if you're watching this on either one of our channels, make sure you subscribe to the other guy's channel. Uh, and then if you're listening to this on iTunes, Government Secrets or whatever, five-star reviews, positive comments, sharing it, all that stuff helps. All those analytics help. Um, cause I don't know, maybe when things open up and we're back on the road, maybe there's a, maybe there's a couple of live government secrets. I don't know, buddy. I could see it happening. Uh, I could see it happening. It'd be a lot of fun. Um, so all my stuff's at GrahamElwood.com. You can watch my show political vigilante. We, we'd go on a Nissan leaf tour of the country. Yes. The <laughs> leaf tour, Nissan leaf tour, coo -coo -coo, charging across America, <laughs> except where it's outlawed. Um, <laughs> Uh, charging across America, looking for the next charging station. <laughs> That's the name of the tour. <laughs> looking for the next charging station. The looking for the, is there a charging station outside of your venue? Well, then we're going to do a show there. If there is, <laughs> I don't know what to say. Um, uh, and yeah, you can watch political vigilante on YouTube and also rockfin.com slash Graham Elwood, which is a blockchain cryptocurrency platform. Lee is on there. Um, it's the future. I've still been demonetized by YouTube, which is bullshit. Also, my political vigilante merch is now available. It's on demand. So just uh, go to GrahamElwood.com. You can get the PV logo. You can get Make Gotham Great Again on all a myriad of products. So support what I'm doing there. And I think that's it, right? All right, man. Yeah, that's it. Uh, keep fighting and I'll see you next week. You got it, buddy. Light up. Right, thanks for watching, everybody. Please hit the like button, the subscribe button. Go to patreon.com slash Graham Elwood and rockfin.com slash Graham Elwood where you can support the show. Also, I have a Bitcoin wallet, a Bitcoin cash wallet, and an Ethereum wallet in the show notes. We're taking cryptocurrency. I have a Coinbase affiliation link. We're going to be getting on some other exchanges. So that's how you support the show. Make sure you hit the subscribe button. YouTube is unsubscribing us at an alarming rate. I have a PayPal button at GrahamElwood.com. I even have a Venmo at Graham-Elwood. There's a lot of ways to support our show. We are getting crushed by YouTube. They're We've dipped under 73,000 subscribers because of YouTube. Thanks for supporting what we do.